what up Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. Today, we got another rendition of Hey Chris, where we answer questions from our subscribers on subtext. And joining me to give you all the insight is none other than the man himself, Chris Fedor. What up, Chris? Ethan, what's going on, man? How are you? Shoot. We are living. It's St. Patrick's Day. It's my first St. Patrick's Day in Cleveland. And, I mean, I live right next to a Irish pub. So, although I was not participating in the festivities, all day long, I got to see a bunch of green running up and down this little red bridge that's next to my apartment complex. And, Let's just say these people get pretty wild for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> did you get any corned beef? I did not. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, because I am one of my friends bartends at the bar and that's to where I'm at. And he was like, yeah, we usually open at 10. We have to open at 6 a.m. And he was literally is still there. And it, we're recording this at 10 p.m. on Sunday. So... I was like, hey, man, I would love to give you business, but I feel like you're going to get a lot that you don't need me to come in there (laughs) and give you any more flack. So I'm going to just let you do your thing for the day. I'll come get some corned beef another day. (laughs) Man, bad move, Ethan. There are so many different spots in Cleveland to get really good corned beef, especially on St. Patrick's Day. And that's something that you got to take advantage of now that you're a Clevelander. By the way, that red bridge, oh my God. So a number of years ago, our office for Cleveland.com used to be in that area where you're at, down in the flats. And one day during lunch, I was working in the office and I wanted to get a bite to eat. So I walked to the flat iron. I got me something to go. And as I'm walking back to the office, I'm on the bridge and it starts ding dinging. <laughs> Right. And we know what that means. Yeah. The bridge starts moving. But here's the thing. I really, really wanted to eat my lunch (laughs) and I didn't want it to get cold by waiting the five minutes for the bridge to do its thing and then go back to where it started. So I ran as fast as I've ever run in my entire (laughs) life over that bridge as it's starting to move. And I like did this mission impossible hop right over the edge at the very, very end. I mean, I had, I don't know what my 40 yard dash time is, but it had to be close to like five, maybe even under five, because I used to be really, really fast in my heyday. And I went back to my old roots. I sprinted across that bridge. I jumped off of it with my food in my hand in a bag. And I made it back without the bridge moving with me on it. It was unbelievable. Yeah, now I think they give a little more timing now for the warning bells for when it's about to move, but that's insane, dog. Yeah, the ding ding happened, and I was like, well, I got two choices. I can get off, and I can wait here for like five to ten minutes, or I can try and book it. (laughs) And book it you did. (laughs) (laughs) That's phenomenal. You're probably right. I should have taken advantage of it, but I am more of a people watcher anyway, so it was fun to just see all the people being chaotic uh, on my street. But enough about St. Patty's Day, because these subtext questions have nothing to do with that. I think we should get into it, Chris. You ready? All right, let's do it. All right. First question. Hey, Chris, can we now please expect the Cavs and Donovan Mitchell to err on the safe side when it comes to being healthy for the playoffs? And isn't being healthy and fresh far more important than the seed in order to make a deep run. So for everybody that doesn't know already, Donovan Mitchell has a lot of stuff going on, to be honest. He got hit in the face by Tristan Thompson with an elbow, so he was already listed as out from the Indiana Pacers game with a nasal fracture. And then he also said post-game after the game against the Houston Rockets that his knee was not feeling 100%. So. Chris, I know you were there in Houston, now in Indiana. Give us a little more insight and get into this question with the subtexter. Well, I think it's important to realize this, Ethan. There are certain guys in that locker room that hate missing games, 
hate it. This is their livelihood. This is what they work their asses off for all season long. To be at their best in March and April, help this team make a playoff push. Everybody understands the importance of seeding. So telling Donovan Mitchell not to play basketball when he thinks he's ready to play basketball is not an easy thing to do. So it's not a situation where the Cavs are either we're going to be cautious or we're not going to be cautious. Or the Cavs are saying, well, we need to get him back on the court for seeding purposes. In having conversations with Donovan over the last weeks, he felt, one, that he was ready to go, and that's why he played against New Orleans. He felt like he could make an impact for the team, even if he was less than 100%, and he felt like he just kind of like needed to build himself back up on the court in game situations, build the confidence in his knee, build the strength back in his knee. So one, he thought he was ready. Two, it bothered him that the Cavs were not playing well at the time that he was missing because of the knee issue. So had the Cavs been playing with a little bit more consistency, had they been winning games, I think Donovan would have looked at the situation and said, well, I'm not going to force myself back into the lineup because we're playing well enough. We're not losing ground in the Eastern Conference. But it was hard for him that, one, he was missing games. Two, there was uncertainty when it came to his knee. And three, the team wasn't playing well without him. If they would have only lost one of those games, if they would have gone undefeated during that stretch, I don't think Donovan would have been looking at the situation saying, they need me. They need what I bring, even if it's in a decoy role even if it's in a lesser role, even if I can't be the score, the explosive score that I know I can be. So it has been hard on Donovan to miss the number of games that he has missed. And he is not somebody who likes missing games. So part of the reason why he came back against New Orleans and then played again against Houston, beyond the fact that he thought he was ready, is because... He wanted to get back out there with his team and try and help as best as he could. And he quickly realized, especially in the game against the Rockets, that he couldn't move the same way. He didn't have the same explosiveness. He couldn't blow by guys off the dribble. And it was kind of like an epiphany to him. It was a realization to him of, okay, I'm still not where I need to be. I got to sit my butt down. I got to give more time for this knee because there are bigger things in play. And as stubborn as he is, his inability to play at the level that he knows he's capable of two nights in a row, both against New Orleans and against Houston, I think has led him to this conclusion of, all right, let's really shut it down. Let's allow more time to rest and recover and then see where the knee is at, because it's just not responding the way that I was hoping that it was going to. Yeah, Chris, and a follow-up question from another subtexter was, is there a plan to get him back or for him to recover? And based on what you had said, based on the article that you wrote that everybody should go read, I didn't get the indication that he had a set timeline on when he thinks he'll be back, especially saying that he's not going to play against the Pacers and the nasal fracture being on top of that. I think he might be out for a little bit. Did you get that same impression? I asked him point blank. I said, how long do you think you're going to miss now that you feel like you need to give your knee more time to recover? How long is it going to take to get it back to full strength? And he said, Chris, I just don't know. So I don't think there is a timeline. I don't think there's a lot of certainty from the Cavs, and I don't think there's a lot of certainty when it comes to Donovan either. The thing that that did stand out to me that he did say to me was that he doesn't feel like any kind of other operation is required or any kind of injection is going to be necessary. He had the PRP injection. It was about two weeks ago. That was the step that he felt like he needed to take. The people around him felt like he needed to take and and the Cavs as an organization felt like he needed to take. So now that he has done that, the belief is from everybody, including Donovan, that it's just going to be a situation where he needs to take time off and he needs to let his his knee heal and rest and recover that way. But there isn't something else, according to him at this point, there isn't something else that that he has to do when it comes to the knee, no kind of like cleanup or 
anything along those lines. So if there are positives, I would say that that is one that they don't have to do any kind of other thing other than just rest it and allow it more time to recover. Yeah, and I want to get into this next subtext question, Chris, but I have to give some prep work beforehand because we have to look at this next game with the Indiana Pacers, how the Cavs have been playing against great, good, and mediocre teams. And right now, with all the games being finished that will impact the Cavs in the Eastern Conference standings, the Boston Celtics obviously are still in the one seed. And they have already clinched their postseason spot for the year. Milwaukee is now ahead of the Cavs by one and a half games in the second seed. Obviously, the Cavs sit in the third seed. New York is two games behind them in the fourth seed. And the Orlando Magic are two and a half games in the fifth seed with the Indiana Pacers sitting four and a half games behind them. Obviously, this Pacers game is important. The Pacers game has players with the Cavs down. It's also going to be the first time that they get to face Tyrese Halliburton and Pascal Siakam in the same lineup. But this subtext question says, why are we in the pattern of beating good teams and losing to teams we should beat? Why is CPJ sitting? Why do we leave our starters in when we are down 20 with six minutes to go? JB needs to get these guys better prepared for these average teams and obviously we don't consider the Indiana Pacers to be an average team they are obviously in the playoff contention but as we mentioned in a previous podcast the Indiana Pacers are one of the better options for the Cavs to face in a seven game series especially in the first round of the postseason so Chris I think we got to break this question down bit by bit and the first part being Why do you think the Cavs are in a pattern of beating good teams and losing to teams that they should beat? I don't know if there's any specific X and O's type reason, strategical reason. (laughs) I just think the Cavs are playing really inconsistent basketball right now, Ethan. And I think their level of play is going to continue to vary, especially given all the bodies that they're missing. And look, players don't want to make excuses and coaches don't want to make excuses. But I asked George Niang point blank last night in the locker room on camera, I said, what is the solution to fixing the inconsistency that you guys have shown since the All-Star break? Because you're below 500 since the break. You've only won two games in a row once since the break. And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, dude, there is no easy answer to this. Donovan's not right. We don't have Evan. We don't have Max Struess. We don't have Dean Wade. It's just, this is a point in the season where I feel like the Cavs margin for error, even against lesser opponents, is smaller because of the pieces that they're missing simultaneously. Because every time you miss a body, the the roles and the responsibilities of, of the next guy are going to change. And sometimes they change drastically. Not having Evan Mobley and Dean Wade simultaneously, and Max Struess, by the way, who can play some small ball four, has forced George Niang into the starting lineup, and it has caused J.B. Bickerstaff to use Damian Jones as the backup power forward. Like, think about that. Those minutes throughout the course of a game, whether they're six minutes, whether they're 10 minutes, could be the difference between winning or losing that game. So I just think there are a lot of things that the Cavs are dealing with right now And I just don't think they have the margin of error that they had, obviously, at the beginning of the season when they were full strength or close to full strength or not missing as many important bodies at the same time that these guys are missing. And here's the other thing, Ethan. We know based on how the Cavs are constructed, a big reason why they won 51 games last year and got the four seed was because of Donovan Mitchell. A big reason why they were able to not only just stay afloat during the time that Evan Mobley and Darius Garland were both out, but rise up the standings during that stretch is because Donovan Mitchell. He was playing like an MVP candidate. He's the Eastern Conference All-Star, the lone All-Star representative that this team has. If the Cavs are going to be a great team, if the Cavs are going to be a consistent team, they need Donovan Mitchell to be one of the best players in the NBA. And since the All-Star break, 
He hasn't been. And there are reasons for it, and we talked about the reasons for it, but when Donovan doesn't play at the level that the Cavs need him to play at, where he's impacting the game at both ends of the floor, where he's the dominant force at both ends of the floor for this team, they're going to struggle to consistently win games, even against some lesser opponents. So I think when you jumble all of that together, you have a formula for the Cavs playing some inconsistent basketball which is what we have seen on top of the fact that this schedule is absolutely grueling and they're playing against some pretty good teams during this stretch. And every game against that good team that they play is going to take something out of them physically and mentally. Yeah, I I agree with that. That's the point that I was going to make. I'm looking at the schedule right now and you had the Celtics game where they took the best team in the Eastern conference to the wire, pulling that one out at the very last minute and then you go directly to Atlanta where they lose to the Hawks at the back-to-back game. Back-to-backs are always difficult, not to mention the amount of effort they had to put in. And then the next game is an overtime game against the Timberwolves, with they, which they are able to pull out. Then you get to stay at home, but you have to play the Brooklyn Nets, who absolutely just shot the lights out of the ball. Like, there are situations where it's hard to come by Like, defensively, the Brooklyn Nets simply could not miss at one point. And that's not a meaning to say, like, the Cavs weren't playing defense, albeit they were lacking on defense, but because they were missing. But then you have the Suns, which we know the Suns have three of the best scorers in the league. They go back to beat the Pelicans, and then they lose to the Rockets. I mean, it's hard because we look now at the injury report for the Indiana Pacers game, and By the way, the Rockets have been playing really, really well. Oh, they're hot as heck. They're hot. I mean, they've won five in a row. They've won seven of their last ten. Jalen Green has taken his game to a completely different level. So, yeah, I mean, on paper, the Cavs are better than the Rockets. They should beat the Rockets. But Houston's been playing better at a time that the Cavs have not been playing all that well. So I think that has to be factored in the equation, too. I agree. I mean... Now you look at the Pacers game and you say, okay, this could be a tough matchup because Dean Wade is doubtful. Max Struess is out. Donovan Mitchell is out. Evan Mobley's out. And Tyrese Halliburton has a way of getting all of his teammates involved. Plus you have the influence of Pascal Siakam in the paint. And it's just going to be a tough matchup because obviously Jared Allen, who has not missed the game since missing the first five games of the season, is also getting worn down, even if you factor in that there's been breaks and things of that nature. But the season is ruling on these players. And I think that's another thing that we can't ignore. We kind of joke about Damian Jones being the backup power forward, but he's played decent in the last couple of games. I'm not saying he's great. I'm not saying he's been saving the team, but he's been able to contribute. And my thing with him has been that he's continued to look more comfortable with more opportunities. And I think that's always been the biggest thing to me with Damian Jones. Like, I never really thought he had confidence because, like, he comes off the bench or he doesn't play or things of that nature. So just seeing him, like, have a little bit of confidence against the Rockets, against the Pelicans, was pretty big for me, especially because who knows how long Max Struess and Evan Mobley are going to be out. And then Dean Wade now being on the injured list as well, that factors into his minutes. Yeah, but the broader point is Damian Jones is not a four. Correct. He's a five. He should be the backup center at this point. Now, Tristan Thompson is back, but Damian Jones and Tristan Thompson should be battling for backup center minutes behind Jared Allen based on what kind of skill set the Cavs need from that particular spot after Jared. Damian Jones and Jared Allen shouldn't be playing together at the same time But the Cavs don't have any choice in matchups against bigger opponents. What are they supposed to do? I mean, you can't put Isaac Okoro as the full-time backup four. You can't put Karis LeVert as the full-time backup four. And you certainly can't play George Niang 48 minutes. I mean, it's part of the reason why they went out and got Marcus Morris Sr. And they signed him to a 10-day contract. And he's supposed to be available against the Pacers. Because they just don't have enough capable bodies at the power forward spot right now. Because Evan Mobley is supposed to be the starter. 
when he's out, Dean Wade's supposed to be the starter. Both of them are out at the same time. So all you have is George Niang and your best options to play the small ball four. Those just don't always work based on the particular opponent that you're playing against. So Marcus Moore Sr. might get minutes in his first game because they need somebody to fill those minutes behind George Niang at this point. And, and Damian Jones, like I said, is not a power forward. He doesn't have that kind of skill set. I mean, he feels like as playing that position, I got to space the floor and I got to stay out at the three-point line. And he has hoisted a couple of threes in his last couple of appearances. And I'm like, bro, that is not your game. Get near the rim. Run some pick and roll stuff. But at the same time, I get it because he's playing out of position and he's playing in a spot on the court where it doesn't cater to his skill set. So it's just a tough situation all around for the Cavs right now. Yeah, and I want to get more in depth on the Marcus Morris acquisition after the break. But the last part of this question was, why has CPJ not been playing? And it's kind of unfair to say that as soon as Donovan Mitchell gets back and now he's back on the injured list. When you have Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, Kerry Silvert, it's really, really hard to find minutes for Craig Porter Jr. I will admit, Craig has been very good at getting to his spots when he's gotten minutes, right? But we have mentioned on countless occasions, it is more than just how the players are playing in these games right now, but creating confidence for the guys who will be getting extended minutes in the postseason and getting them experience in different scenarios with different players, different rotations, things of that nature. But with Donovan Mitchell being out for probably an extended period, Craig Porter Jr. will more than likely find more minutes. Yeah, the other thing that's tough too, Ethan, and you know, it's not to say that J.B. Bickerstaff will not do it because he has done it in the past and he did it recently. But playing CPJ and Darius Garland together, that can lead to some complications especially on the defensive end of the floor. That can lead to some limitations, especially on the defensive end of the floor. Combined with the fact that you don't have Jared Allen and Evan Mobley together to provide that level of protection on the interior. So it seems like, unless it's a special case, J.B. Bickerstaff is relatively hesitant to play Darius and Craig at the same time. And when Donovan Mitchell is healthy and available, you know, you just run out of minutes. You run out of spots. It becomes a math equation. It becomes a numbers game. And it's a conversation that we've had for a majority of the season. There are only so many minutes available at the guard spots. And that happens to be a very deep position on this roster. So it's going to be hard for Sam Merrill to get consistent minutes when the team's at full strength. It's going to be hard just the same way for Craig Porter Jr., to get consistent minutes when the team is at full strength or close to full strength. But like you said, Ethan, now that Donovan Mitchell is going to be out for an undetermined amount of time, it will allow Craig Porter Jr. to get more playing time, more opportunities, and maybe a chance to run the second unit and show whether or not he's capable of doing that on a consistent basis and show that he belongs in the rotation moving toward the end of the season and maybe into the playoffs. All right, Chris, now that we've ran through some subtext questions, I think it's time for a break. When we come back, we'll get into two more subtext questions regarding the new acquisition for the Cavs, how important it is, and a look at a potential contract coming up. But before then, Become a Cavs insider and interact with me and Chris by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from Chris and me. We'll be right back. All right, Chris, you mentioned it before we got into the break. The Cavs made a new acquisition after the trade deadline, and they brought in Marcus Morris on a 10-day contract, 
and he is not only eligible to play in Monday's game against the Pacers, but he is also playoff eligible for the Cavs. So this subtexter asks, why did the Cavs pick up Marcus Morris? Why now? Why not earlier? Why a 4-5 when Tristan Thompson was coming back? Why not a 3-4 when that's a known weakness? Well, because sometimes, Ethan, you just have to go based on what's available to you on the market. You know what I mean? It's not like the Cavs can go out in the buyout market and there's this big supermarket and they can just pluck whoever they want to and say, this guy has every single skill that, that we need based on our current roster construction. It's just a situation where Marcus Morris Sr. has a ton of big game experience. He has a ton of experience in general. He's been on a variety of different teams, so he understands his role. He understands where he is at this stage of his career. And I do think that if we're being honest about it, this is the positional area that that we have talked about all season long for the Cavs as a potential weak point, just because is George Niang going to get played off the floor in a postseason situation? Is Dean Wade going to be able to make enough shots on the offensive end of the floor and, and make enough plays and do enough positive things on the offensive end of the floor combined with all of the rebounding that he brings to the table, combined with all of the little things that, that make him such an asset, including his defense. The version of Dean Wade that the Cavs got in last year's series against the Knicks was a guy that the Cavs couldn't play in that series. Again, a variety of reasons for that, a number of circumstances that led to that. But I think there's some uncertainty about which Dean Wade are the Cavs going to get in a potential playoff series. So when you combine those things with Evan Mobley still recovering from an ankle injury, questions about Evan Mobley's physical readiness for playoff basketball, that to me is the spot where I think there are the most questions and potentially the most available minutes based on what else happens with Dean Wade, George Niang, if the Cavs get into a seven-game series against a specific opponent that may be able to exploit those two guys' weaknesses. So I think it makes sense from that standpoint, a positional standpoint. I think it makes sense from a fit standpoint. And I think it makes sense from try and find as many people with big game playoff experience as possible that you may be able to lean on or trust in a certain situation. Or maybe you don't have to play that guy, but it's nice to at least have that option on the bench for whatever situation it may call for. And look, Marcus Morris Sr. is not going to start playing 35 to 40 minutes on this team. Guys that sign with new teams on the buyout market historically do not make a big difference. You have to go back about a decade, maybe more than a decade for Peja Stojakovic. But it's just another option, another insurance policy for the Cavs at a time where they're short on bodies at the power forward spot. Tristan Thompson can't play power forward, by the way. He's a five. We mentioned the struggles that Damian Jones could have, also the lack of experience that he has in postseason, stuff like that, and Marcus Morris obviously brings that, and also a little bit more size, because I know a lot of people complain about Jared Allen being a little softer, a little smaller at the center position, and Tristan Thompson obviously is a little slender, but is able to throw his weight around, but... Marcus is known for being a bulldog and being able to throw bodies and things of that nature. So I think he's going to be able to, if not just be a force on the defensive end, rebounding, but he'll also be an enforcer. And I think that's something that even without talking, the Cavs are going to be happy that they have. But Chris, we're down to the last question of the podcast. And it is from our guy, Dave from Tucson, who says, hey, Chris. With Isaac Okoro entering the restricted free agency this offseason, can you go over what the recent history is of wings who entered restricted free agency? And what will Isaac's qualifying offer be? Do you know of any potential teams that might want to beat the non-tax-paying mid-level? Well, I don't know any specific teams yet. I think a lot of things have to play themselves out when it comes to the playoffs, when it comes to the first portion of the offseason. Is there a star out there that demands a trade? 
Is there a guy out there that can change the landscape in free agency? So I think a lot of things are still to be determined on that particular front, but his qualifying offer is something that is going to protect the Cavs. And I think that's the biggest thing when it comes to restricted free agency. And his qualifying offer is right around $12 million or something like that. Historically, teams have not wanted to make an offer to a restricted free agent, tie up some of their salary space while waiting for the other team to decide what they're going to do, just because there's an understanding from a lot of teams around the NBA that the team that that player is on is just going to match the offer sheet anyway. And historically, restricted free agents stay with the team that they were on previously because there are just so many different moving parts involved with that sort of thing. Now, there could be a team out there that is lurking, that is eager to give Isaac Okoro the kind of contract that the Cavs would be queasy to match or it gets them in a precarious salary cap position. But I don't know that there are a bunch of teams that are lining up to try and do that. There are still limitations that Isaac has. There are still questions, I think, that other teams would have about his overall game and his overall skill set. Just how much can he be a factor on the offensive end? How real is his three-point shooting? What would he be outside of the Cleveland system where Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland are creating so much for other guys and creating space and getting open shots for these guys? So I just think there are a variety of questions attached to Isaac to begin with, that while there is appeal as a potential 3 and D guy, a young 3 and D guy who is showing progress on the offensive end of the floor, I, I don't necessarily think that Isaac is the kind of player that a team is going to break the bank for, especially when you consider the fact that Miles Bridges is going to be available. So I, I do think restricted free agency is, is going to protect the Cavs. It has protected teams in the past, and it has certainly given them an upper hand to decide, okay, if you want to test the market, Isaac, go test the market. And if a team wants to do the bidding for us, if they want to set the value of him, if they want to identify the value of him, then okay, let them identify it. And then we have the ability to match or we have the ability to try and work out a sign and trade or, or something along those lines. So I think there are a lot of moving parts. I think there are a lot of layers to this. But the sense that I get is that the Cavs would love to have Isaac back. They value him. They've invested in his development to this point. And they're hopeful that he doesn't get the kind of massive offer that would cause them to balk at it. Yeah, and... Just to give Dave some restricted free agents from 2023, some significant names. I got Trey Jones from the San Antonio Spurs. Stayed. Stayed. Miles Bridges was a restricted free agent. He just Miles took Bridges. The offer. Nasir Little from the Portland Trailblazers. Dwayne Washington Jr. from the New York Knicks. <laughs> Not really a household name. No. Jackson Hayes from the New Orleans Pelicans. Restricted free agency just makes it tricky for yeah. another team. That, I mean, that the Lakers had Austin Reeves it. and Roy Hachimura from their restricted agents in 2023. They both stayed. That's a mini list. Now, obviously, there are more out there. I'm just scrolling through the teams, trying to pick them out as we go. But the only player that was on a restricted free agent deal for the Cavs last year that stayed was Isaiah Mobley. Dylan Windler and Mamadi. Mamadi Diakite. Yep, yep. He was gone after last year. So obviously If Isaac Okoro was an unrestricted free agency candidate, then I think obviously there would be a better chance of, of him walking. I just think at this point the sense that I get is something will get done between the Cavs and Isaac. And I think there's enough appeal to the situation in Cleveland and enough desire on the part of Isaac, just in general, that he would prefer to stay. And three more quick ones just for me before I wrap this up. The Boston Celtics had Grant Williams, who was on a restricted deal, Cameron Johnson with the Brooklyn Nets, and 
as Chris mentioned, Miles Bridges and P.J. Washington from the Charlotte Hornets, but also Kobe White was on the Chicago Bulls' restricted free agency. So those are just some of the guys that were on restricted free agent deals in 2023. And I think, Chris, if there's nothing else you want to add on the subject, that can do it for today's episode. Yeah, man. I think that's about all I got. And y'all know the rules. And Chris says we're done. Then we're (laughs) done. All right. But until next time, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy. But we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.